It's time for the Soteriology 101 podcast, where God is most glorified by his love and provision for all people. Welcome your host, the Director of Apologetics for Texas Baptists, an adjunct professor of theology and a local teaching pastor, Dr. Leighton Flowers. Welcome to Sociology 101. Today I've got a special guest on the program with us, um, Rob Ely. Is that pronounced correct, Rob? That is correct. Ely, I got it right this time. I know we talked about you. got it right. I don't know if your ears were burning the other day, but we talked about you. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Pritchett um, was on, and we talked about you, and I think I called you Rob Eli, and it's Ely. (laughs) I apologize for that. Rob is a pastor in Waterloo, Iowa. He is a doctoral candidate at Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary. That's how we met, is through Trinity. Um, He was a student in one of the courses that I taught, and um, one of the few Calvinistic guys on in my sociology class that was really pushing back quite a bit because as you can see I'll pull up here on just Rob can't see this because he's on the telephone the landline but I'm pulling up your just your Facebook page your your front page and you could tell pretty quickly just by seeing the front page of of Rob's um, Facebook where he stands here he's got the Reformation and Martin Luther right front and center so we know Rob is a good Calvinistic brother and he has at times contended with some of the things that I've said. And I, as you all know who listen to me regularly, welcome contention and welcome people disagreeing with us. I'm fine with people disagreeing, but I am going to push you to know why you disagree with me and uh, to be able to support those things. And so I just invited Rob on. He's a deep thinking Calvinistic brother who likes to, to think deeply and to, to dig into um, a, the, the text as well as into history. And I appreciate that about any brother because that's what iron sharpened iron does is it pushes us to go deeper. And so um, Rob and I have some things in common. He've got, he's got five kids. I've got four. So I can somewhat relate to what you're going through. I don't know if you – do you ever listen to the comedian, Rob um, – oh, what's his name? Um, blonde-headed guy, big guy. I think he's got five kids. And uh, Tim, Tim Hawkins? Or? Well, Tim Hawkins is funny too, but I was like a Gaffigan, a uh, Jim Gaffigan. <laughs> oh, okay. talks about he talks about having five kids he says you just imagine drowning and then somebody handing you a baby <laughs> so he said that's good I like have five kids it's just it could be one of those uh, daunting tasks so. sometimes it felt like that <laughs> <laughs> yes sometimes sometimes it can feel pretty daunting anybody who can endure um, being a father of five children um, and and all of that it deserves respect on any level so regardless of your theological mistakes many as they may be Rob uh, <laughs> there's much respect for of mutual fathers that you uh, endured to five children. So with, with all that said, I know that you have said on, on, you know, a couple occasions through Facebook that you felt like I, I didn't fully represent Calvinism. Um, I know you kind of tend to be a little bit more of a, a moderate view, maybe even, I, I don't, I don't want to label you in any way, but um, maybe more of a MacArthur kind of a Calvinist. Uh, I say MacArthur kind of Calvinist because I use MacArthur quotes quite regularly to contrast with some of the higher, um, you know, guys like the Bible thumping wingnut guys who tend to be more of an A.W. Pink kind of Calvinist, a little higher, you know, uh, Gill kind of Calvinist. Um, I, I tend to kind of pull in guys like MacArthur in order to combat some of their extreme, seemingly extreme kind of views. And you strike me, correct me if I'm wrong, you strike me more as more of a moderate kind of a Calvinist, maybe a little lower form of Calvinist than some of those other guys. And therefore, maybe some of my contention with some of the higher Calvinists has caused me to represent all Calvinists in a little bit too deterministic kind of way, or maybe too much like the higher Calvinist guys are representing Calvinism to be. And so maybe I've, I've, I've developed a blind spot doing this for so long with guys like that um, that I'm not fully representing guys like yourself who are more moderate kind of Calvinist. And so I want to give you f- a fair hearing and let you kind of maybe express some of your own concerns, maybe the way in which uh, I haven't represented Calvinists the, to the best that I could, and and then we'll just talk about it. Does that sound good? Sure, sounds good. And I appreciate you having me on, and I appreciate the gracious words. Uh, I do want to say, first of all, to your listeners that uh, – I consider you a brother, brother in Christ, and uh, uh, you know I I honestly don't have anything personal against you, obviously, and and I guess that's one of the things that uh, makes uh, me passionate about this this whole this whole 
issue is, you know, I have a, I'm a pastor, and being a pastor, uh, you know, I, I, I don't like it when uh, brothers uh, don't, you know, say things that, that are not helpful and create a division. And uh, there's enough of a chance for us to, and a need for us to create a division against people who uh, say things that are truly um, heretical and off. Right. I mean, and, and I'll be the first to say that, that I agree with you uh, in, you know, probably your your assessment that um, John MacArthur is, is you know... One Hello? 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 Uh, oh. R.C. Sproul was being sorry. You kind of you, you kind of cut off on us there for just a second, Rob. But you, you were sorry, yeah. you, the last thing you well, said. Kind of MacArthur. Yeah. Go ahead. I enjoy reading MacArthur. I enjoy reading Sproul. Uh, you know, uh, one of my uh, go-to guys, scholarly wise, is uh, John Frame. And so, if you that kind of kind of frames where yeah. <laughs> where I am. Frame frame frames you. So, okay, good. All right. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. I mean, and I'll be the first to admit that uh, there are plenty of people to be found, plenty of Calvinists out there to be found, that uh, take, uh, t- take a wrong view as well, and they take it to the extreme, and I, I would be the first to, you know, point at them and say, hey, brother, you're, you know, you don't need to be looking at that. Especially when you see somebody saying, well, uh, Non-Calvinists are are just you know they're heretics and things like that. I don't view it that way at all. Right. I see there's the very uh, we're brothers, okay, and so uh, that's I think that's that's what kind of motivates my heart to be grieved by some of the things that I've I've seen uh, you do, and so um, that you know that being said, I would not want myself into the uh, Bible thumping, wing, wing nut, and pulpit and pen. God forbid. No, I wouldn't be. <laughs> I wouldn't be in. in I, would, you know, I don't know that I'd invited you on. I don't know that I'd invited you on if you'd have been <laughs> too gung ho about yeah, that. Anyway, so, so. But here's 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 my contention, and 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 I I've read you enough, and I've I've read your book, and I've taken three of your courses, and I so I've I've heard you enough, and I've listened to some of your podcasts. To know that there have been times, um, frequently, and uh, from my point of view, where you will, you will, in your quest to disprove Calvinism, maybe, or I'm not exactly sure what you're trying to do, but, but in your quest to um, to prove your point, you will, you will uh, pull out a quote from a Calvinist, and I've I've heard you quote. John Calvin, numbers of times I've heard you quote others, but it seems like Calvin, not uh, not Calvin, but well, you do that too. But <laughs> but John John Piper though, John Piper is a favorite of yours, and uh, and one of the things that I that I uh, you know, and I I certainly admire you going to the source of of you know the, the quotes and everything. Uh, and say this is what Calvinists have said, and uh, but what I've found though is that it's not so much what you have quoted, but what you have inferred or concluded from what you have quoted. For example, uh, you know, many times, and I have I've seen you use this many times, and it it seems to always come back to the problem of suffering and evil. Sure. Uh, yeah. You, you 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 tend to go there and and I know this is more of a f- philosophical debate I'm more of a theology guy that's my that's my major and, and so but uh but it you know it comes down to you know inevitably uh freedom of the will and god's uh you know god's uh, what what god has has you know what his involvement is in uh the suffering of the world and things like right. that, and I've I've heard you quote from, you know, the book by uh, that that was edited by John Piper and Justin Taylor, uh, called "Suffering and the Sovereignty of God," which is a compilation of essays um, from 
different people. And you'll find, uh, I've found quotes from this book in several of your works. Uh, and there's a uh, specific essay that you use uh, quite often from, from Mark Talbot called All the God, All the Good That is Ours in Christ, Seeing God's Gracious Hand in the Hurts Others Do to Us. Mm-hmm. Now, right off the bat, I mean, let me just say, you you pull out a quote from here, and it has to do with uh, the. Jews it's on the it's on the, the screen, concentration right? Concentration camps and things like that. Right. Yeah, it's on the Sorry? screen for our listener, just so um, you're right. aware. Um, it's a quote from page right. forty-two. And I'm sure they have heard you quote this many many times, and and so, you know, first my contention I want to say is that is. We're dealing with a very, very, very difficult issue when we're dealing with uh, the problem of evil and suffering. This is not something that we need to take lightly, or is it something that we need to to be simplistic about? Right. And I think you would agree. Oh yeah, no, right? absolutely. I mean, and and so, however, what it comes down to, though, and we we see in scripture and this is where i like to go i i i i don't do well with philosophy and things like that i've had philosophy courses in undergrad and things like that but uh, i'm not a philosophy guy you know but so i like to go back to scripture though and and what you see in scripture uh you you see both you both both things in scripture you see where man is completely responsible, that his sin is completely responsible for the evil of this world, Mm -hmm. and therefore he bears full responsibility for uh, doing the evil that he does. But you also see that the hand of God, you also see Scripture uh, telling us that, that, hey, this was also, you know, God's, God's plan as well. God, you know, we see that in Genesis 50, verse 20. Uh, We see that in uh, Isaiah 53, talking about the cross. We see that in in the story of Job, uh, that, you know, we see that in uh, in the story of uh, of, uh, Micaiah, the the prophet, uh, and uh, and what he prophesied against Ahab, and uh, about the uh, spirit of lying, that you know, the uh, lying spirit that the Lord sent to, and so there, there we see then the the, the Lord's hand in uh, the works of of this world, and yes, even in the the evil things of this world. But see what we can't do though, and what I think I I was showing you, uh, you know, on Facebook earlier was we we. We can't think of these things, though, in the same category that we do from creature to creature. There is a category difference that we have to take into consideration. Just like God says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. He tells us that we can't take vengeance upon people, and that is because we're sinful creatures. We are created beings, and he's God, he's holy. And see, this is where it makes all the difference in the world, Leighton, it is, is God is completely holy, God is completely good in everything he does. And so when, and see, this is the backstory, though, that, that, that needs to be told when you pull out quotes from Calvinists that, you know, because I know you use them, uh, you use them for the shock effect, you use them, you know, that this is what they said, and so look what this Calvinist said, this is, you know, and the, the effect you're going for is, in, you know, is, is, is uh, shock, you know, why in the world would somebody believe this way? Well, let, let me push back well, just I mean, a little bit <clears throat> before you go sure. on, um, sure. and I'm going to give you fair, fair hearing, of course, I, I, I don't want to, um, uh, you know, interrupt your you know, you're trying to thought, but I, I do want to push back that my motivation is really not to just shock people. My motivation is to tell people what Calvinists actually are saying and teaching. 
And if right. that's itself shocking, matter of fact, even in the quote you refer to, it says this includes as incredible and unacceptable as it may currently seem. So they are even acknowledging the shock value of what he's uh, affirming to be true, that God has right. brought about the br- brutality of Auschwitz, that he's brought about the terrible killings of Dennis Rader, that he brought about the sexual abuse of a young child for his own glorification. That them, They themselves recognize that that is seemingly unacceptable and shocking in and of itself. Exactly. And, and I um, agree. Yeah, and do you, uh, before I guess before we move on, are you saying that you affirm Piper's and Mark Talbert's quote here with the caveat of what else he also argues? Or do you take more of what I quote later on from MacArthur, which actually says pretty starkly different, um, I'm, I'm scrolling down to it, um, where he he kind of argues from the problem of evil. He says, um, well, there's a big quote here, and I don't want to read it all, but at the very end of it, he says, God's certainly sovereign over evil. There's a sense in which uh, it is proper even to say that evil is a part of his eternal decree. He planned for it. He did not. It did not take him by surprise. It is not an interruption of his eternal plan. He declared the end from the beginning, and he is still working all things for his good pleasure, Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. But God's role with regard to evil is never as its author. He simply permits evil agents to work and then overrules evil for his own wise and holy ends. Ultimately, he is able to make all things, including all the fruits of all the evil of all time, work together for a greater good. And then I go on to say, he notice that he says he simply permits evil agents to work and then overrules evil for glory, whereas Piper's article says just the opposite. He says, quote, God isn't just managing to turn the evil aspects of our world to good. It is rather that he himself brings about these evil aspects for his glory. So my question was, which is it? Is, is God bringing about evil or is he permitting free moral creatures, free will, Is he permitting them to act in that way and then using their evil deeds to bring about possibly good plans and purposes as it suits his purpose or his his redemptive plan? So those are the two that seemingly, even between two Calvinistic brothers, seem to have a different um, way in which they were handling this problem of evil that we both agree is is a problematic issue. And and that's why we are gracious to say Calvinists aren't you know, heathens that, that, you know, are, you know, demonic and all these other things like some people try to paint you guys. I, I understand that you're trying to answer a very deep philosophical and hard issue, which is why I try to give grace to my brothers to say they're trying to do the same thing that the open theist is doing. I, I don't think either one of them, the terminus or the open theist, is doing a very good job of it. I disagree with them. But at the same time, I, I do recognize their intentions are good. And so between Piper's explanation and MacArthur's explanation, You've got one of them saying God simply permits evil agents to work and then overrules evil for his own wise and holy ends. And the other one saying God isn't just managing to turn evil aspects for our world to good. It's rather that he himself brings about these evil aspects for his glory. So which of those two perspectives do you tend towards in your own explanation of theodicy? Sure. Fair fair question. And I understand why you're asking that. Um, uh, I think, first of all, let me say that uh, the choice of, of words uh, is very important when we talk about this. Um, and I think uh, oftentimes even defining words is very important because when you, for instance, when you talk about the word ordain, okay, well, what does that mean? What does it mean that God has ordained for things to happen? What does it mean uh, when we say that God ordained all things that come to pass? And then that, you know, leads to us asking, what does it mean, if this is true, what does it mean that or that God ordained for there to be evil in the world or for there to be sin in the world? I mean, there's a, that's a loaded question, and we have to really get to the bottom of what this means. We also have to get to the bottom of, okay, what does Scripture say? And then what does Scripture not say? Because I think oftentimes what happens, and this happens with Calvinists just as much as it does with non-Calvinists, and 
what happens is we we see what Scripture says about things, but then we take it to uh, what we think is logical conclusions. And I think sometimes that's where we get into trouble because uh, what you what we what we end up doing is I mean what's that word that I just used logical right and so mm-hmm. and I am in no way and am I saying that Christianity the Christian faith is a non logical uh, faith it is it's logical it is it's it's coherent and but. There is, even in Scripture, there is a limit to what finite man can understand in uh, terms of uh, the uh, nature of God and also his works and his will. And so I think that's where we begin to run up against a wall here. And so to answer your question, um, there may be some terminology that uh, John Talbot, I'm not John Talbot, Mark, uh, yeah. Yeah, Mark, Mark Talbot Talbot. uses um, uh, that may be a little bit more unfortunate. Maybe he hasn't chosen his words uh, quite as good, and I would tend toward maybe more toward MacArthur. But I don't want to go to the extreme of just saying that that God simply allows, you know, the evil to happen. I mean, because when you look at when you look at at, at Genesis. 50 verse 20 and Genesis 45 verses 4 through 8, what you see is there's a spe- it specifically, you know, it does say that, okay, you have both things represented here. You have the, the uh, you have man and his responsibility, Joseph's, son, uh, Joseph's brothers, uh, you know, you meant it, or evil, and that word is the same word that's used in the second part, where it says God meant it for good. Now, some people would would want to just say, well, you know, God God just allowed it to happen and turned it around for for His good, or you know, for Joseph's good and for the good of of of, of Israel and everything else. But I'm not willing to say that because. Uh, it specifically says that God meant what happened to Joseph. And so we have to deal with this, though. We have to deal with this without without going down and, and drawing conclusions that uh, simply for the sake of us uh, trying to understand all the time. Sometimes we have to take what Scripture says, and I think this is what Calvinism, uh, at least... Um, uh, historic Calvinism that's not not heretical, you know, like like uh, uh, hyper Calvinism. Uh, historically, Calvinism has has sought to deal with these scriptures and deal with the tension between the two and not ignore one over the other. And so, we have to ask the question: Is there? First of all, there's two things. We have to ask the question: Is there? a sense in which God is in control of, or, or I'll go as far as to saying, is there a sense in which he is ordaining the suffering of this world? And I would have to answer scripturally, yes. But what does that mean, okay? Well, one thing, pastorally, that, that it means, okay, and this is where pastors can, can, uh, can, really benefit. What that means, first of all, if you remember back to uh, uh, 9-11, 2001, you know, we our uh, nation got attacked, and, and everybody was just, you know, fearful, and, and how could this evil happen to us, and things like that. Well, what was one of the messages that came out that comforted everyone? It was this, God is in control. And I think it goes beyond just God, okay, well, this happened, but, you know, God can t- turn this around for good. I think it has to do with, you know what, God never lost control. God is, is, God is in control of everything that happens, and not would only you, that, would you be comfortable? Good. Would you be comfortable saying that God brought about the 9-11 event? For his own glory, as the quote said there from Piper and Talbert. I will. I would say. 
I would say. Well, I mean, would you say that from the done, pulpit? Is what I'm asking. I would say, well, what I would say to, from a pulpit, what I would say between uh, scholars is two different things, and I hope you would understand that. So well, not. I wouldn't agree with that, but I, I understand not, why you might do that. But I don't. Yeah, I don't think you have to say something as, different in the pulpit than you do sure, to scholars not personally. Two different things as far as being di- diametrically uh, opposite. But I wouldn't get into the. Uh, no, I understand. Yeah, you, know, get, you hard, get into the heady, theological. hard theological p- problems in the pulpit necessarily. Sure. I, I understand that. But 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 I guess what I what I would say would you believe that God sovereignly brought to pass or brought about through compatibilistic means, however that wants to be described, the 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 horrors of nine eleven, so as to demonstrate and bring about His own glorification. Well, I have to I have to come to the conclusion that it was definitely part of God's plan. I mean, I don't think anything happens, and and he's surprised by it. That that would be something that uh, more along the line of John MacArthur. Right. He's not surprised about it, but he know, permits it. Correct. And so, then turns it for. So at least, at good. the very least. So yeah. let's 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 start from the least and go up now. So at the very least, it was part of part of God's plan that this happened. He knew it was going to happen. But here's the thing. Did God just sit back and allow it to happen, and then clean up the mess and turn it for good? See, I don't see where that really lets God off the hook, because because a God that, you know, whenever you're trying to give a theodicy for God, and you try to use the, the idea that, well, God... Uh, could have stopped it, but he didn't. He, you know, because he allows man to have free will, and so he just sat back and let it happen. But then he's going to come around, and he's going to he's going to uh, turn it for your good. Well, I, I honestly don't see where that lets God off the hook. Because so we're going to really, put God more on the hook by saying he actually meticulously planned and brought to pass the intention of well, those who did that. I mean, do you see that? Do you see why that would even be worse? It at least doesn't make it any better because that what that implies is God sat back and just let it happen. Well, let, let me push so back on that because I think I, that, I think like Rabbi Zacharias and C.S. Lewis and others who do have a free will theodicy with regard to the origin of evil and the continuation of evil that all things will be made right in the end. Um, that because it doesn't happen within the temporal world right now, that he doesn't step in to stop the the full weight of our free actions and our free decisions. It's not an indication that he does not want it to or that it, he, he planned for it to happen, but instead that he allowed for human choices and the full weight of those choices to come to bear so that we would experience a world that's not under his meticulous deterministic control, but instead under the principalities and the rulers of this dark world. And therefore, we're experiencing a fallen world. Um, that's why we pray, God, let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, because it's not always being done here on earth as it is in heaven, and we want it to be. And so the way that we would answer that from our free will theodicy is to say, yes, God permits free creatures to act in the full weight of those, those sinful choices um, we're experiencing on a daily basis. And he does not intervene well, because to intervene would be to assume that he wanted a more deterministic kind of world where he does control and, and stop things that happen that are evil versus permitting a world to continue under the reign of uh, of free free moral creatures and principalities of this darkness. Well, see, we have to deal with with several theological things here, several biblical things here. Okay, first of all, to to answer your question, what does it, is it the case that God permits uh, man to carry out his sin? Uh, First of all, let's, let's come over here and let's look at uh, scriptures such as Colossians 1, 17, uh, Hebrews 1, 3, Acts 17, where it, where it clearly says that, that he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And Hebrews 1, 3 tells us that he is the radiance of the glory of God, so on and so forth, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So we're seeing then that, that, uh, and then in 
Acts 17, you know, we have the, the, the quote that in him we live and move and have our being. Amen. Yeah. Well, he was talking to, you know, not only, he was talking to non-Christians there even. So, but the thing is that as if all things, if the whole universe is being upheld by the word of his power, and if Christ is holding all things together, then you see that nothing happens outside of what he allows, at least, at the very least, what he allows to happen. And but what's, I want to what's he you, allowing, if not free will? Is he allowing but, his own determinations? See what I'm saying? See, you, you have to have, have to something to here. allow. Sure, but see, now we have to go over here to a place where you and I don't agree, and that is the subject of total depravity. Now, I don't want to get into the nitty-gritty of it. Maybe we can that can be another show. But if... If the uh, we see in Second Th- Thessalonians chapter two that God is restraining evil, okay, that there is a there is a the reason why things aren't as bad as they are they could be is because there God is God God is actually restraining evil to a certain uh, to a certain extent. Well, let, now, let me let me ask about that just for a second before you move on from just the point of God restraining evil. Um, I think a good example of that is one you've already referenced to Joseph and his brothers, that Joseph, Joseph's brothers actually wanted to kill him, according to the text, right. and that God restrained that, that evil. In other words, that would be an example of what you're talking about, where God restrained yeah. them from doing. So wasn't that their own free will? I mean, in other words, the brothers, God did not, in other words, determine sovereignly, unchangeably bring about their intention to kill the brother and then restrain them from killing the brother, did the, right. he, in other words, he's restraining, no, he he's to. restraining free will. But see, but see, that doesn't have to, be, but see, if you take the Calvinistic view of total depravity, though, God d- doesn't have to, uh, directly bring that about, because man is already uh, sinfully wanting to do what he wants. And so when all God would have to do, and I'm not well, saying just, this just, exactly... Well, time out, time out real quick. Just because somebody's obviously depraved doesn't mean they're automatically going to kill their brother. It, the, he obviously, they obviously still had a choice, even within their depraved nature, whether to kill or not to kill, um, whether to lie or to, to cheat. Um, you, even within the fallen nature, you have choices you can make, libertarian choices that you can make in the sense of even within that fallen nature, you could you could cheat or lie. I mean, both of those are uh, uh, consistent with the fallen nature. You could you could cross help a lady cross the street or refrain from helping a lady across the street, even as a reprobate. Um, and so, right. so we're not. I don't think you're trying to say that they don't have at least the liberty to to choose to kill or not to kill their brother. And so you're not trying to say that total depravity in and of itself, their nature somehow determined that they would most certainly choose to try to kill their littlest brother, are you? I'm not, but there, but here's the rub, though. Here's the rub. Number one, you know, you have to deal with two things here. Number one, you have to deal with, uh, you know, every, you have to ask the question, is everything that come to pass, is that according to God's plan? Does everything that come to pass is that is that unfolding as God has, uh, has planned it to, to 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 unfold? And that now this this isn't even dealing now with with how those things come about. Now this is just specifically talking about God's plan. And I look at history, and I look through Scripture, and I see a continual uh, you know a, a continual unfolding of God's plan throughout throughout history and uh, throughout Scripture. And I don't think any of it happened by accident. I don't think anything uh, happened apart from God's plan. But now let's deal with, now let's go into uh, Joseph's brothers, though. And this is where I would disagree uh, with those that say compatibilism is, uh, is just the same as determinism. Because to me, now maybe philosophically, if you want to deal with it in the philosophical, classical way, uh, but I'm not. I'm dealing with it theologically, so I just want to just want to, you know, draw the, the uh, parameters here. Theologically, we have, there, there, there must be, and 
this is where this is where it, it, you know it can get really where we don't know exactly how things work in God's plan, but there there is a a a uh, harmonization of where man is actually acting according to his will. But again, that is a depraved will that is coming from a sinful nature. But we're also seeing that God is bringing this, or has at least ordained, for these things to happen. And so, how does that happen, though? I'll be the first to tell you, I don't know. I have okay. no idea the ins and outs of, of how God brings that about. All I know is that God is completely good and completely holy and can do no wrong. Okay, so uh, when we say... but. but just to jump in, just kind of a little bit of back and forth on on the, just a couple of those points. When we say God is holy, what we're what we're saying is that He's without sin, that He's separate from humanity. The word "separate" there, yes, I but, think, is really important but, because that's the autonomy right. of of free will. Exactly. The defense and of free will is actually the defense point. of holiness. But see, that's my point, though. That's that's my point exactly. Is is it does mean that He is completely sinless. But it also means that he is completely other than, and that's where we get into the category errors that that we commit when we try to draw conclusions based on uh, the uh, the tensions that we see in Scripture. And right. so I. Again, well, I, again, I, 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 I would I I, the way I would push back on that is maybe not you, but some Calvinists like Mark, Mark Talbert, uh, Piper, uh, Justin Taylor, uh, the editors there, they, they tend to, it seems like to me, to draw a conclusion, one, that God brought this to pass, that God um, um, determined that this should happen, um, that God planned this. And that is distinctly different from God using the libertarian free choices for his plans. There's a, I think there's a careful way in which you still maintain that God is holy, 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 that he is separate from the autonomous uh, will of creatures, and that he's not bringing about the desire of the brothers to kill, but in fact he's restraining them from doing what they intended freely to do. Um, and that's a, actually um, that's actually an affirmation of our position, not a denouncing of it, because it's showing that they had. Otherwise, you've got God restraining His own determinations, and that doesn't make any sense. If everything is determined by God under the sovereignty definition that some Calvinists are bringing, then therefore there's nothing to restrain or permit except that which He's already determined. Which, when when Jonathan Edwards is pressed on this by his opponents. He, uh, he, he goes back to, well, when he's get pre- he, he uses the word permission for a while, and then he gets pressed on it. And when he gets pressed on it by his opponents, he goes, well, I don't mean bare permission. And then when he gets pressed on it again, what does he mean by not bare permission? He means, well, God's permitting what he's decreed. In other words, God's permitting something that he just, he, he caused, he, he determined to happen. And that doesn't work either. And so all I'm trying to push back on is I'm trying to push back on to say, okay, if we're going to appeal to mystery, it's fine to appeal to mystery, but let's p- appeal to mystery with regard to man's capriciousness and not God's character. Let, let's appeal sure, to mystery with here. regard to how we don't understand how man's autonomous free will um, uh, functions perfectly, but we, we do know that God's not the one who, quote-unquote, brought evil about or in any way planned for evil in the sense of made it happen or caused it to happen for his own glorification. That's, that's what I've well, been trying to fight for is more of a maintaining well, we of his holiness so i mean it, we see that in scripture though and and we see that for instance going going back to joseph that he you know he meant those things that were that that happened against joseph but he meant it for good purposes though and that brought glory to him well he meant but he meant the for them is, that he meant for them to be permitted to carry out one evil deed and not another both of which were okay, autonomously sure, but, decided but, but by the look, by the brothers, not by God. Sure, but look, if God is if God is holding all things t- together in this universe, okay, and if God is restraining evil, if God lifts His hand and and allows somebody to uh, to function in their in a greater evil that that is theirs. That is man's. That is that person's. In other words, he, the, God allows allow God, them to be libertarianly free. Lifts his right. hand, God lifts his hand and allows that person to act freely in, 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 in more of his total total depravity. 
But see, what you have now, you have the man being totally uh, responsible and it laying upon him, and so he is completely responsible. But you, but you have to see that God still lifted his hand and meant for that to happen. So, well, so then that is more of a... I think that is more of what I think we mean by when we say that God ordained... Uh, for things to happen, and then well, let me get, let me give a let's give an example. I know every human analogy falls short, but you you, I mean, okay, I, I have a couple of children with Compassion International, and and you may be helping ch- children, but let's just say there's a Christian pastor in our in our world today, and we'll use you know just a guy named Bob out there, okay? So there's a guy named Bob who's a Christian pastor, and he does not help with any starving children in Africa. Okay. He, he just does not get involved in that particular issue. And there are starving children who die every day. And, you know, I think it's something like 25 a day or something like that die of starvation. Um, had he got involved, I mean, he makes, you know, $55,000 a year. Had he got involved, he could have probably prevented at least one child from starving today. Um, he could have done that. Now he chose not to what, for whatever reason, good or bad, he chose not to get involved in that issue. Um, is that the same is that equal, the fact that he refrained from getting involved? Is that equal to if he had a child in his own house, locked in his own house, that he's starving? It, it, to me, there seems to be a really stark difference between permitting bad things to continue in a world that are already happening versus actually planning for or in any way causing or bringing something about so as to show off your own glory or your own namesake. And again, I know those analogies fall short. I know they're not perfect. But what I'm trying to do is at least show that that the concept of permission, which you seem to want to use that word an awful lot, something that, that even Calvin himself denounced as childish and a vain refuge, you, you want to use the vocabulary words that I like, that I want, that traditionalists actually use, I, words like permission, allowing, um, that, that God's holy and completely separate. It seems like you want all of those words while at the same time, denouncing men like Piper or I guess even Calvin or Mark Talbert for the vernacular that they're using. And yet somehow I'm the one misrepresenting Calvinists. And, that, and that's where I kind of push back with you on Facebook is just to try to say that, that, yeah, there are Calvinists who go too far here. And you've even kind of acknowledged that maybe their verbiage is a little bit too robust in that area or too, um, you know, not, not careful enough in that area. And, and maybe behind even that, that softer language, the intention it may be, be good, but it still seems that they're putting onto God something that n- not necessarily needs to be put onto God, that we can say he, that he's permitted the world to go in a certain direction, and he, he is allowed for free moral creatures to act freely. As Psalm 115, verse 16 says, he's given the world over to man. That, that is his pleasure. He, he's pleased in his sovereignty to give man freedom and to suffer the full weight and the consequences of that those free choices. Sure, but see, what we're talking about, when we talk about verbiage, though, and this is where I had a contention with you, is when you pull out somebody's quote, uh, especially if maybe they had used a, a little harsher or a little more edged verbiage than, than maybe I would have used, nevertheless, I don't just read that quote. I read the whole thing of what they what, what they've read and I mean written and what else they've written and I try to discern what they're meaning by that because they may be they may say something and this happens all the time with people with other issues uh, with just common everyday issues. Somebody will say something and somebody will will hear it in a different way than what the person meant it, and he didn't mean it in the same way. But see, we have to to understand, though. We have to see the broader context. And so that's why I contended with you about just pulling out uh, even a seemingly very, uh, you know, admittedly, you know, really tough quote from a person who is a Calvinist. Again, maybe I wouldn't have phrased it exactly like that, but there are there. But what he was trying to do, though, in in his essay, was actually to bring comfort that hey, these things were not just capriciously happening uh, outside of God's control. Uh, you know, there there is goodness that 
we don't understand. And that well, and that brings that and that brings up another another issue. I I know I've I, you've probably heard me refer to it before, and I know Calvinists don't like when I do, but that the movie The Syndromes, where you've got you know the the little evil villain guy, the syndrome in the sky uh, of the Incredibles movie where this little kid's obviously bringing the, the robots to attack the world. And he's actually the one who created the robots and is controlling them with the remote control on his wrist. And he's doing this to, to make himself a superhero. So everybody will, you know, thank him and praise him and everything else. Cause he, he's jealous of the superheroes. Well, I mean, once they find out that it was him that brought the evil, it, it, he's lost all the glory for conquering the evil. Um, and it seems to me that when Calvinists step in and try to say, hey, God is the one who actually brought this evil thing, this rape of your child about, this horrible, heinous thing that happened to the, you know, through the Nazis' brutality, this killings of Dennis Rader, God's actually the one who brought it about for his glory, that that's somehow supposed to be a comfort to some people. And many people don't find comfort in that. They don't find comfort in the knowledge that God has brought to pass or has sovereignly ordained the the heinous evil in their life for his own glorification it seems to me what what really brings glory to god is to say god hates that god will avenge god's justice will come and that he's going to redeem um, and bring about good for all those who love him in this world and he temporally in this world he will bring a healing in your life he will redeem because he hates that he did not desire for that to happen he did not plan or decree or cause or whatever verb you want to use there. He hates that evil, and he's here for you to redeem even in those evil circumstances. Uh, again, maybe yeah, maybe confident. people are just made differently to where some people are really comforted by the fact that God, the one they love and worship, is actually the one who's instigated this in some way towards them. And that he's also redeeming it from them as well, and that that somehow brings them comfort. I guess I I, I don't know. Let's see. Let's see. This is this is where I this is where I contend with you, though. Okay. So first of all, back to syndrome and, and the and the whole thing. Again, we have to be careful not to commit a category error here, and that's exactly what what happens whenever you use it, um, illustrations. And I've heard you do it many, many times. You, you use illustrations like this, and, and you use it to, to, to make a point that, hey, you know, this is kind of like this, but it's not. Because number one, you know, God, you know, man is not God. And so what, what man would mean for evil, in, and again, we don't know exactly how God brings things about, what he does, and we don't know his, his ways beyond what he's revealed in Scripture. So I caution you, I caution people to, hey, let's, let's not make it say something it's not, first of all. But second but of it all— It seems like to me if, that we're if, the ones that are saying— we're the ones that are saying you're going too far, Piper. You're going too far, Calvinist, some of you. You're going too far to say things that Scripture do not say. And, that, and that's what we're trying to say is that you're undermining the holiness of God and you're, you're going too far by using some Old Testament uh, idioms with regard to their, the use of atenomy where sometimes you would say something like the White House has brought you know, Iraq into shambles. It doesn't literally mean the house on Washington Avenue has brought Iraq into shambles. It means that um, when Barack Obama pulled the troops out, um, things went back to their natural condition, which is in shambles because you've got evil people doing evil things. Barack Obama didn't go cut off anybody's head. Barack Obama didn't go over there and cause all the stir of the problem. He simply refrained or, or he simply pulled out uh, the troops that were keeping order. And so some people use that kind of language to say, well, Barack Obama, i.e. the White House, caused this thing to happen. And the same things you'll see this throughout Old Testament where God is blamed for things, yes, because he did not prevent something, because he, he allowed for free creatures to act freely, um, which is actually an establishment of libertarian freedom, not a denial of it. And so those kinds of verbiage that you see throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament are, are statements which may sound like it's giving direct blame to God for something, when really it's an antinomy. It's a saying that this is, this is God's uh, uh, permitting or allowing for man to have its own way, to give him over to the, the lust of his flesh and the desires of his heart. And look what happens to the world when that happens, when God uh, allows wrath to, to reign. 
um, and people's sinfulness to continue. That, that to me, establishes freedom of the will. It doesn't denounce it. And see, do you see, do you see the difference between the two perspectives and how you verbalize those things um, and how you explain those things to people in such a way as to not to undermine the holiness and the goodness of God? I understand what you're saying, but the, but again, I think that the situation is a whole lot more complex than what we're trying to make it here. Uh, to, so, first of all, going back to uh, what I would say to, to someone who, you know, who's had a, uh, a child that, you know, uh, something bad happened or whatever, um, I mean, obviously I wouldn't sit there as a pastor and I wouldn't tell them, hey, God brought this about, you're going to be okay. We don't say that pastorally. But if we're dealing with, on a scholarly level, if we're dealing with uh, academically, what's going on? What does Scripture say? Well, we see, see, so often we get so close to the trees that we don't see the whole forest, and 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 see what happens is is we get so caught up in the emotional aspect of the the uh, the heinous crime or the thing that happened to a child or uh, the terrorist attack. And we get so caught up in the emotional uh, aspect of something that's happened. And then when we bring something in that say, well, you know, God was in control, well, that's totally a wrong context, or the wrong timing, at least, to bring that up. But it doesn't negate the fact that, hey, somehow God, you know, is carrying about all these things to a greater end. But, but what, we're, what we have to do, though, is back way up. We have to back way up, and we have to see things from God's point of view, which we're not capable of doing, by the way. But, sure, sure. But at least we have to realize that that's what needs to happen, and see the end from the beginning. That hey, one day when eternity comes, comes, you know, and we look back on all these things, you know, Scripture even it says that this light momentary affliction, light momentary affliction, that's the, that's not something that a mother who just had a child you know, uh, suffer through something would call it, but that's mm-hmm. what Scripture calls it. And so, but that's from a God's eye view, though. that's from a God's point of view, and that's why right. I say this is not something to make simplistically, and this is a very complicated issue that really, when you use human uh, uh, analogies, it's not really helpful, though. Because well, it, all sides, it, it I really think, doesn't use, transfer over. All, all sides it use really human doesn't an, transfer over. Well, no, I understand what you're saying. All, all sides use human analogies to explain. Jesus used analogies, human analogies. I mean, the fact that we call him Father, a shepherd. I know, but that's um, what I Potter. contend tend with you about, though. That's what I contend with you about because usually, the times I've heard you use the human analogies, they haven't been sufficient, and they've they've. And so that's when Calvinists like me will say, hey, wait, 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 wait. That is not what we mean. Right. Well, And so there's a okay. whole lot more that there's a whole lot more in back of us saying that, though. There's a whole lot more that would take a whole lot more time for us to, to unpack uh, than, you know, than we probably have at that moment. Right. Uh, you know. Well, and, and I understand that there are more nuances that can be given to something to help to soften it. But. I'm, I'm trying to get down to, one, what is the intention of the authors um, when writing certain things with the example of the ten enemies that I've already mentioned? What, what were they attempting to say um, just as a, you know, a, a newspaper writer when he says the White House put Iraq into shambles? What was his intention by that? Was he literally meaning that the, the White House did that or was he, was he using a figure of speech, an idiom of the day to indicate that, that Barack Obama's decision to pull out was – the cause, indirect cause of the the shambles that that ensued, um, and things like that, I think, are just ways in which we we look at the whole of Scripture, and and, and come to come to the Scriptures with the assumption that God is good, and, and good by the measure that we can actually recognize. Because as I think C.S. Right. Lewis aptly argues, if his if his black is our white, and um, our white is his black, and good is not good by any other means, and we can only say we worship we know not what. We have to have but some measure God of what good... good. We, but, but, but some, 
sometimes God is good in ways we can't recognize. And that's the point of the whole problem of evil, though, and that's when sometimes we as pastors and as even as theologians, we have to, we have to be ready to say, hey, look, I don't understand why this happened. And, you know, and this is where we can come, come together, Calvinists and non-Calvinists. But why not stop there? Day. See, why, why not stop but, there? Because but, but Calvinists don't, don't stop don't there. Many, why this happened. But many Calvinists don't stop there. They, they go on to say, we know God brought it to pass. We know God did this. I mean, I've got the, the last thing I did with John Piper. My last episode with John Piper is actually him saying, well, God did it. We just don't know how he did it in order and in, in, to, to maintain his sinlessness but we do maintain yes, I remember that we that, do maintain that he that, did it that podcast yeah I, I remember that wait wait I remember that podcast and I and I'll um, possibly I can I can come on again because I I caught what you said when it says that when he said that God did it and if I I can't recall the context that he's that that you said you know that you were quoting at the moment but I I remember thinking, wait a minute, that's not what, what Piper, because you said that, that it meant something else than what I was discerning Piper meant. And so we have to really define, okay, what did so-and-so mean by, you know, when they say God did it? Well, you, what, what is, I mean, I played the whole episode, mean? so you can go, y'all can go back and, I mean, the listeners who are here, go back and listen to what he's talking about. And he's talking about all future events. I mean, all things that come to pass. And, 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 and he was talking about the question was, are we surprised? Is God ever surprised? And he goes on to argue, well, you can't be surprised by things that you're, you're the one planning and bringing to pass. And he's the one who brings to pass all future events. Um, he's the one who, who has planned it and is bringing it all to pass. And so the reason the future unfolds the right. way that it does is because this is what God Performs. He performed it. He actually even says Piper. And so, yeah, we may be we may agree with the fact that sometimes Piper and or Mark Talbert or whoever else is not careful with their vocabulary words, and and that's and that's really been my biggest contention with some Calvinist is that they're not very careful, and they're actually saying things that that are logical implications as we mentioned before of higher Calvinism of even more hyper kind of Calvinism that I know you reject, and some of that that lack of careful vocabulary plays into the tendency of the next generation that's going to become, I think, more hyper, just as we see from R.C. Sproul Sr. as an as a infralapsarian and R.C. Sproul Jr. now as a superlapsarian. I think you're going to see, as history repeats itself, that the natural tendency of the next generation is to take things into more of a logical consistency of the system's claims. And that's what I think you see the Piperites uh, and John Piper and even some of the higher Calvinists beginning to do in their vocabulary, beginning to be less careful with how they express God and his actions. And if, if they were acting like you do, or you are right now on the show, I'm not going to have it. I probably wouldn't have ever started the podcast. If I wouldn't have ever even contended with Calvinists if they were saying things like, we just don't know, and we, don't, we just can't explain it. But they're not just saying that, Rob. They're going on to say, we do know God brought it to pass for his own glory. We do know God that God sovereignly decreed these things. We do know God that God, you know, uh, you know well, did this. And well, so that's well, what I'm contending they're with. Only, they're only saying that because Scripture says it. But, but, but <laughs> no, it see, does it. We have to go it into, it. It but, but see, we have to go into, we have to go into, and, and here's what I would ask you. Okay, here's what I would ask you. I would ask you that if you're going to pull a quote from a Calvinist and you think it that it sounds sounds edgy or even wrong, I would ask you to please also include, you know, if you would or if you can, uh, what else a they, link they a say. link to the article where you can read it in its fullness. Um, that would be like fine. This. That would be fine be- because <laughs> like because right and here. I mean you and I both know that. Uh, a lot of folks won't go read it, so it's up to you and me to make sure that we explain things fu- more fully. Because I would have the same contention with any Calvinist that didn't, that would just leave it like there. But see, what the thing is though is Mark Talbot didn't just leave it like that. If that was the only thing he said, then I would be as as up in arms as you are. But that's not the only thing he said, and it's not the only thing John Piper said. And so that well, the, on, the only thing he goes on to say that you quoted on Facebook 
was he appeals to mystery, much like John Calvin does himself, as to how God's not implicated in the moral evil, though he does bring it to pass. In other words, he goes on to say, because of the categorical differences, which, what does that mean? Can, can you explain to me the category in which God is determining evil versus the category which he's not? I can't. Exactly. So why even say that he is? That's my point. Because why not appeal to, why not, no, no, it doesn't. It because, does not. That's that's where a point of contention is. Okay, let's stop there. No, um, but okay, so let's good. Okay, 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 okay. All right, so <laughs> you you believe that Scripture says God determines all evil events because he determined the cross, for example. He determined the Joseph selling of Joseph into slavery, for example. He he determined the the hardening of Pharaoh, for example. Uh, he determined the king of Assyria. I don't like the, the word Assyria. determine necessarily. I don't like the word determine. I okay. like the word ordain because it, it, it much better. Because it allows for permission, uh, which is our word. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> I'm just I'm giving I'm giving well, you a Well, I I I I probably wouldn't go as far as you would with that as well. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. So all go right. Ahead. So <laughs> you do know, obviously, that we even as libertarian free will advocates affirm that God does bring about some things. The inspiration of Scripture, for example, the, the redemption of man's sin on Calvary. We do believe God did work within the temporal world. He sent the Son. I mean, incarnation, that's what incarnation is all about, is God stepping into our world, uh, into the temporal world. We, we do believe that God does step in. He, he sends a messenger into the temporal world through an angel. Um, he does interact in the temporal world at times when it has served his purpose and serves his purpose to do so. And therefore, pointing to unique examples where God has worked in some way, whatever that way may be, whether it's through you know the ways that the Calvinist talks about or way that we talk about, some way he's worked to ensure the bringing about of a, a, a something like the crucifixion, um, which you know I've likened it to a police officer hiding his identity um, and entering into the drug world. Um, like in a sting operation where he goes undercover and he hides his identity, he, he incorporates himself within the people, and therefore as to manipulate the situation where they sell drugs at a particular place on Thursday at 1 o'clock so as to catch them and to stop selling drugs, that if you were to witness this or if I were to write about it, that you would walk away and conclude, oh, well, that means that police officers um, sovereignly, or well, not use the word sovereignly, obviously, but meticulously work to bring about all the drug deals at all times. Well, obviously, that's absurd, but that's but what that's, I think but, Calvinists have done by again, using you've unique committed examples. A category error. You've committed a cat- category error again because, I mean, you, you really what does that can't, mean? You can't what what does that, that mean? Uh, Leah, uh, Rob, talk to us like we're not, like all of us are first grade philosophers, okay? First year philosophers. Explain to me in clear terms. What does it mean to make a categorical error with regard to what I just said with regard to how God sovereignly brings to pass this event is not proof that God sovereignly brings about every single moral heinous evil that has ever happened throughout all history, that God's brought about one event to redeem all of you know this, this evil does not prove that God brings about all the moral evil that's ever been brought about. Explain to us what does it mean to make a categorical error in that sense? make a categorical error is to use and to think of the ways of God in terms of the, the creatures. And, and, and that's, that's what happens every time you use an illustration. And it just doesn't work. I'm sorry, but it, it, you, know, you, end up, you end up drawing wrong conclusions. Okay, so give, give, me a better, like give me a better explanation without impugning the holiness of God. Because like I said, I'm going to err on the side of appealing to the capriciousness of man with regard to mystery than I will ever err on the side of God's character. I'm not going to play yeah, around with can... God's character. I'm not going to mess with that. Yeah. I'm not going to say he brought this to pass and then say, but I don't understand. It's all mystery and it's a categorical error if you say anything distinctly different than that or explain it in any other the, way. The, the only thing I can do is appeal to Scripture and 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 I'm appealing use, to Scripture too. Examples. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold okay. on. The only thing I can do is appeal to Scripture and use examples of things like the cross and and uh, what he did with Joseph, where where those things. Now, this is important. Those things reveal the character of God. They reveal that we can trust Him. 
would they reveal that God is all good and that we can trust him even through this light momentary affliction that we go through. And, and so often we get so thrown off by the emotional things that we go through that, that we can't see what God sees. We can't see it anyway, but we can understand that I would point you to Isaiah 55. His ways are, are higher than our ways and his thoughts than our thoughts. But we don't leave it there either. We know that God is, is perfectly good and perfectly trustworthy, and therefore we rest in him knowing that, hey, I don't understand everything that he does. I don't understand why he allows or permits or but we know or he did ordains it. or however you want however you want to say it. We don't understand. Why, why not appeal but to mystery one know. step forward though, Rob? Why, why, why say we're, we're sure that God did something, quote unquote, brought it to pass, decreed it, whatever. We, we're sure that he did that, but then everything else is just mysterious to us. Why not just say man does it? And it's mysterious as to how the function of the free agent works. Well, man does do it. Okay, well, then, then leave it at that. Then leave it at that. Don't 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 but go it, on to say God does it. But I can't leave it, it at that. The scripture doesn't. The, no, the scripture doesn't leave it at that. It, there's a bold sand here, and that's why I say <laughs> there's. I don't agree with you know people who say compatibilism is the same thing as determinism. There is a bold sand here, and where man is, you know, so 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 called free to do what he's he. You know, from our point of view, in other words, from our point of view uh, here on Earth, we see that we're free to do what we want to. We see that we have choices and things like that. That's our point of view, and that's what we understand, right? I mean, and so I'm not going to contend with that and say that, well, God is, you know, God, I can't really do everything or or what I want. I'm not going to contend with that because this is how this is what we understand. What we don't understand is what's going on in 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 God's sovereignty and behind the scenes and why he why he brings things to pass that we don't understand and it's really not for us to understand okay well i understand the the mystery part of it I totally get that part I understand there's mysteries within both of the systems and, and it's fine to appeal to mystery what what i'm really trying to get the point i'm trying to get to is the positive affirmation that calvinists make that god sovereignly and meticulously providentially brings to pass the sinful intentions and actions of men um and of creatures and again, um, and so, Again, let, wait, 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 would, wait, let me finish. Okay. And it seems to me, and you tell me where I'm wrong on this, it seems to me that Calvinists are using unique examples throughout the text where God intervenes to uh, ensure— so Wait, 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 let me, let me just finish this sure. thought, and I'll, I'll say okay, I'm done, sure, go sure. for it. Okay, so sure. it seems to me that you're using certain events throughout Christian history and, and the biblical text— to say, look at how God worked in this circumstance to bring about a certain thing. Therefore, we must conclude that God meticulously and sovereignly works in every single circumstance of all times in the same meticulously deterministic way, or providential way, whatever word you want to use there. And the way I would push back on that is almost like if, if you came and visited my house for a while, and you saw my wife and I hold down my child one evening to give him a shot uh, because he needs insulin for um, his diabetes, which he doesn't. I'm just using an example. But if you saw us meticulously determine him to take the shot, he didn't want to. We physically used our force over him. And you saw us later in the day, you know, physically pull our child out of the way of the traffic. Or, you, you know, you witnessed a couple of these events and you go home and you write and you say, Leighton and Laura Flowers always in every single situation physically manhandle their children to make them do exactly what they want them to do. Obviously, it's an extreme, I'm using extreme example for a point. But what I'm saying is, is you, you seem to be using unique examples where God has intervened, like the intervention of bringing about the writing of Scripture, for example, or the, the crucifixion, to be able to say that, which is incarnational. It, it almost as if you're using those unique moments in time where God has stepped in to ensure something, to, to guide something in a particular direction he wants it to go, and saying kind of a non sequitur, sequitur fallacy of saying because God determined or worked in some way to bring about event X, Y, Z, therefore we know God works to intervene to bring about A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, and a P, and every other letter in the world. Um, that, that, that's where I don't find the link. Where, where in Scripture does it clearly teach and explicitly teach that in the same way God worked to determine the crucifixion, 
in order to bring about the redemption of all sin is in the same way that he worked to bring about the molestation of children that was redeemed on that cross. That, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for that particular link. So you keep saying, well, that's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. Well, you're pointing to a few unique texts where God worked with free moral creatures, in my estimation, to bring about a particular plan and purpose through their free choices to somehow prove that God meticulously, sovereignly, providentially brings about every single dust mite particle, as Piper puts it, thought, action, deed in all of human history. And I'm thinking, okay, where does the Bible say that? That's what I'm looking for. Okay, go. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I, I would go no further than, than honestly, the ones I have already told you. Colossians 1, 17, Hebrews 1, 3, Acts 17, where he is holding all things together. And, okay, and so, so holding all things mean, to, holding all things together mean, means brings about the intentions of a child rapist. No. I don't. Where? How are you getting that? No, no, no. And see, that's where you're. That's where I think you're making a. a, a, a you're, you're making an assumption because I never said meticulously doing this. Well, I don't it's know. A Piper's that, usage. Yeah. I, I totally. I totally think that God will use d different means to bring different things to pass. But here's the thing. If he's holding all things together, if he's holding this whole universe to, to, this together— This whole free universe together, if, if that's possible. Is it possible that God's holding a libertarianly free universe together? Is that possible? But he Can, still, could God he do that? Still, he is still holding everything together. Right, but could and, he be holding— his hand, Could he be holding if libertarian— I use, okay. if, I can, <laughs> if I can use oh, a, no. a human example here, his hand— is his hands are holding all things together. So if you're talking about every dust mite and things like that, well, he, he is holding everything together. Therefore, everything that happens with, within everything that he's holding together, he can either stop or allow. And so the thing is, though, is we have to understand that even when God uh, chooses to, to step in or chooses to allow, that he is still... He is still holding those things together, and therefore he is still causing that thing to happen. Now, it doesn't mean that he is meticulously uh, like a puppet going in there and causing uh, that that child rapist to do what he's doing. But he, but we have to understand, and that, and this is getting into academic study and not not pastoral study, you know, because you would never talk like this to a, a parent. You know, who's, who's no, no, I, we, we, we both understand you're not going to get in real details. Yeah. Even even from our side, we're not going to get into, you know, real a lot right. of details. But I, I would say that I would never say anything contradictory to a parent. You know, in other words, I would never say something that would contradict my conversation with you as a scholar, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a classroom setting like this or something like that. I, I would be able to consistently say to the parent something that I believe and would talk about with scholars. And I think it's it would be. Um, I think it would be a huge blight upon any systematic that would have to lie to a parent in order to be, um, you right. know, in order to I be agree. pastoral. And so, and I think you would, you know, we would have both agree with that. So I, I, I just want to look at some of these passages because oh. I'm still looking for that passage that says right. God has meticulously, providentially brought to pass all things in the manner that many well, Calvinists are describing. It. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, good. You're not going to get so, it. Because, so that, that's but, why, but that, that's all thing. I was trying to get to here's say is because, because you kept because, saying the Bible because, says so. The Bible does not say so. The Bible never says but, what you're saying it says. And that's the point. Just because God, but just because the Bible doesn't say there's a Trinity doesn't mean we don't, that there isn't one either. Just because God, that there isn't anything in the Bible about having Sunday school doesn't mean we, we, we shouldn't have Sunday school. The thing is that, 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 that I'm saying is, on, on our level, on the human level, all we can do, all we can do, and again, I would point us to the cross, and you say, well, these are things that, that, that are uh, unique issues. Well, maybe they were done in that specific way uniquely, but that doesn't mean that God has not ordained everything to come to pass, and what that means, I'm not sure, but, here, but here's the thing. We have to understand that, you know, when we do point people to the cross, which I would continue to do day after day after day after day when people ask me about evil, I would point them to the cross and say, the greatest sin in the whole wide world, the greatest sin that's ever been committed was against the, the, the only 
the only innocent man uh, who has ever lived. And he was a son of God. And But we also see the goodness and the glory of God that, has, that God brought about. How does that translate into all the other things? Well, I, John Piper does a really good job in Chapter 3 of this book um, of the suffering and the sovereignty of God. I really encourage you to read it. Uh, uh, but I, I what he, well, one of the things, well, then your readers, uh, or <laughs> your, your listeners, but um, those... Oh, we've talked about it. He, he, one of the things he, he, he says is that it was, it was God's intention all along for Jesus to suffer. It was God's intention all along for Jesus to go to the cross and for there to be suffering then, for Jesus to be able to suffer, then God had to ordain there to be suffering in the first place. Now, again, let's not... And John Piper doesn't take that beyond what Scripture does, though. But we have to wrestle with these these things that we don't fully understand because Scripture says them. And what that should do, though, what that should do is to bring us to worship. That should bring us to be in awe of who he is and and fall upon the goodness and the and the the majesty and the wisdom uh, and the trustworthiness of God. And honestly, you know, Leighton, that is that is what I hear most Calvinists preach. I mean, no, oh, I, I agree. Were... No, I, I agree. I, I think that a lot of what we're we're talking about, um, is in the locker room talk, so to speak. It's not what's on the field. Um, but that's part of the problem, is that it's been in the locker room closets behind the scenes so long that that's the reason I think that it's growing in its popularity. But, and I don't, and obviously we disagree on this, but I, I believe the, the tulip systematic is an error, obviously. I believe that the explanations that Calvinists have sociologically are wrong. And I think a lot of the implications of the sociology is in the locker rooms and not in the pulpit. And therefore, you've got a lot of people who are who are falling into Calvinism who really don't know what they're accepting as Cal, as as a Calvinist. And I find this with increasing frequency where I talk to people who, well, that's not what we believe. We believe this is this, and I'll point them to quotes, and I'll say, well, this is what Calvin says. This is what Piper says. This is what even MacArthur said on this subject. Even lower Calvinists have said this. Uh, J.I. Packer, says God is, very clearly says God controls men's choices. I mean, he says that very clearly, and yet men is responsible for their choices, and they just accept the mystery. And and and, and the guy was like, oh, I, I didn't know Calvinists believe God controls men's choices. Yeah, that's that's the the basis of the system of the tulip doctrine, um, and and that's what it teaches and believes. But most a lot of people don't realize what they're signing on for, unless they really dive into some of the philosophical and theological issues and implications that come with the claim of the systematic. Um, Isn't that true though of Christianity though? I mean, if it, do, do people really fully know what they're the fullness of what they're signing on to when they first become a baby Christian? Do they know about about dying to self and, and, and taking up your cross and following him? Do they know about, you know, I mean, I, I, honestly, I mean, yeah, I mean, anybody can take any uh, theological system in a, in a, in a uh, uh, simplistic or in a wrong or in a um, immature way that could happen to anything and it does happen but my my thing is okay so what i need to do as a calvinist is to educate them and that's my passion really that is my passion is to okay let's wrestle with these hard issues let's let's not only just pull uh the quotes from these calvinists and say oh this is this person may probably should have said it differently let's take a look at the fullness of the issue and let's wrestle with it and let's teach them okay what uh what the whole picture is because i think that's really where yeah. where a lot of folks you know fall short is when they and i think you know honestly is where 
you're falling short is when it, you're doing the same thing some Calvinists do, actually, and, and when they, they only say this one thing, but they don't give the whole full picture of it and the, the balance of it. Right. And so, well, and, and that's and that's ultimately, I think, why why traditionalism and and the the, the more robust non Calvinistic theology is is been waning over the last two decades is because it's not being spoken of very clearly and articulated. Right. And that's one of the reasons I, I'm a, doing the broadcast. Amen. But, amen to that. But amen but, to that. But to answer, and we'll close with this, and and you know, I'll let you have you know any last words that you want to say, and 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 um and then I've got a question for you too, but. Um, you were you were talking about Calvary, which again I do a broadcast with Piper, who also appeals to Calvary as kind of the kind of the linchpin, you know, like you just now said, way of which to to hold up his his causal determinism of all things by God. He he looks to Calvary as as kind of that prime example, and and the argument goes something like this, and I have this on the screen here. It says if God determined the worst evil of all time without blame. And we should be able to accept that God can determine all evil events without blame. It's kind of the logic um, that that Calvin's, I mean, that Piper's bringing to that. And, and then I write, this is a common error of Calvinists. They they take unique examples of God working to bring about a good purpose through evil intentions of mankind, as proof that one, God sovereignly brought about the evil intentions themselves, and two, that He sovereignly works in the same way all times throughout history. In other words, if Calvinism is true then God worked to sovereignly bring about the redemption of a child abuser in the same way that he worked to sovereignly bring about the abuse of that child. And this, of course, flies in the face of so much of what we read in the Scripture about the character and the holiness of God. Appealing to God's sovereign work to ensure the redemption of sin so as to prove that God sovereignly works to bring about all the sin that was redeemed is an absurd, self-defeating argument. It would be tantamount to arguing the police department analogy that we've already used, and I won't go through that again. But what my point is is that it just seems to me that they're they're overstating Calvinists, maybe not yourself, but some Calvinists seems to be overstating their case to point to things like Calvary as a proof that God, quote unquote, sovereignly brought about the evil intentions of the perpetrators in Calvary, and that He also sovereignly works in the same way that He worked in bringing about Calvary, whatever means those might have been, and so that that's where I think the Calvinists have gone. They've overstepped the scriptures to bring into a, a kind of a, almost even a philosophical conclusion uh, with regard to causal determination of all things, with regard to everything that comes to pass, which which I think undermines human responsibility, and it undermines I think rational discourse and a tenable way of living, where you really do have uh, free choices that are that are made. That people who reject the gospel aren't rejecting the gospel because God rejected them. They're rejecting the gospel because um, of their own choices and own re- their own rebellion, not because of a lack of something that God has provided. Um, and that's where I think this is this is significant, is because ultimately well, the soteriology seems. Talk, uh, yeah, go ahead. We can talk about that on an, uh, another podcast, but. <laughs> yeah, now yeah we're but, we're at, we're above our hour long mark, and so <laughs> that might be another yeah. um, that might be another discussion that we can have, but. Um, but thank you for coming on. I know that we probably sure. didn't solve much of anything here as far as our differences <laughs> well, at least of opinion. We understand each other better. Yeah, and 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 hopefully you can see my my goal in doing this. I mean, you you talked about you know taking quotes out of context and things um, on on Facebook and even you know reference that here. I, I always provide the links of the sources and encourage, and I can go back and even find these for you if you need me to, encourage people to go listen to Calvinists in their entirety and to go back and read the context. Um, because if I'm misrepresenting their intention, then I should be called out on that. If, if, if however, there's, they're just state more, that's, that doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily incumbent upon me to state everything that Calvinists ever say about anything. It's simply bringing up a point of contention. Calvinists very rarely quote all of everything an Arminian or a, not, a traditionalist says. They, they, matter of fact, most scholars who represent non-Calvinism typically represent Wesley and Arminian foresight faith view in a very kind of backhanded, um, lowbrow right. kind of way. And I very have rarely heard anybody quote David Allen, for example, or, or Adam Harwood um, in a scholarly um, way and contended with the actual claims of traditionalists. So. I think as far as if you're comparing what I've done and what any other scholarly Calvinist has done, I've gone way above and beyond um, my Calvinistic brothers in critiquing 
the systematic by playing Calvinists for themselves, by putting links to their original sources for them to go find that themselves, by encouraging people not to, to demonize Calvinist, um, by pointing out people who, who do demonize Calvinist as, as being the true heretics in the sense of causing division, um, by pointing out that when, when, when we call people um, um, horrible names and those kinds of things that we're, we're doing a disservice to the church. Um, in other words, I, I just I, I just think that I've I've strived to be um, less contentious and get down to the roots of the biblical differences that we have and why I believe what I believe. And I want you, as I think I think you're a reasonable fella, and I think you're you're kind hearted and, and 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 seem to be a good brother in the Lord. That when when on Facebook or anywhere else you bring an accusation that hey, Leighton is not representing Calvinist correctly. Um, well, maybe it's not that I'm not misrepresenting Calvinism as a whole wrongly. Maybe I'm representing your form of Calvinism wrongly. Maybe I'm not representing um, every um, height of Calvinism exactly the way you would want me to represent it. Maybe I'm highlighting too much of what Talbert says and Piper says than what maybe MacArthur says. Um, and, and that could be brought into contention. But I think it's a misrepresentation to say that Leighton's not representing true Calvinism, because I think that by playing their quotes, putting their original context, um, and and showing what their intention is in saying these things, um, even though they may appeal to mystery as to how God is not culpable and all those kinds of things, it doesn't change the fact that they are saying God is actively working to bring about, about heinous evil for his own glorification. That in of itself is a troublesome, even by your own admission, um, contention. And I don't think it's a biblical one. If I don't think it's a biblical one, it's only right for me to say so. It's only right for me to argue that from my, you know, from my viewpoint and explain why I believe that. And that's what I've been striving to do on this broadcast. And so I just wanted to be able to say that to you, you know, voice to voice, at least not face to face, maybe, but voice to voice to say, that's my heart here. I'm not trying to misrepresent all the Calvinists. I'm not trying to misrepresent you. I'm not trying to drag your name through the mud or anything of that nature. If anything, I'm trying to allow Calvinists to speak for themselves. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I I, I I would encourage your those who listen to your podcast, uh, you know, to to also take your cue and uh, read you know read more Calvinists. I mean, read them and and understand them seek to understand them better because i one thing i have found because i've i've read our honey and books like i've read uh roger olson and i i'm shocked at how much we agree <laughs> i really am I'm, I'm, I'm shocked at how much we agree and 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 so i would i would just encourage you know those who listen uh i think you're a closet traditionalist to, seek to understand <laughs> seek to understand the fullness of what we mean by what what we say, you know, and hey, I don't agree with everybody either, you know. But at the same time, I also know that sometimes people say things that that there's a whole lot more to unpack uh, than what we're just focusing on. Sure. Well, that's always the case. Um, there's always more material out there and, and ways in which to verbalize things that can be maybe less contentious than other ways and um, totally totally agree with that and that's that's can be on both sides um, and so uh, we we have gone plenty long Rob and I, I really appreciate the time you've taken out of this afternoon this was kind of a last minute thing for Rob just so my listeners know it was only this morning that I, I asked him on Facebook hey come on to the program and he he agreed and uh, and so he he didn't take you know days or any weeks or anything like that to prepare for our discussion. And uh, he has aptly um, represented himself and, and I think uh, is a good brother in the Lord. And I appreciate you coming on and, and talking through these things with me. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate you. We'll talk to you soon. All right. All right. Bye-bye. All right.